I've been a Salisbury, the City Mayor, and it's a very, very pleasure indeed to welcome you here to City Hall. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, I hope you like what we've done with this building. It was uh, the Municipal Officers, 1938, you know, very much, as you'll see, in the, uh, in the start of the period. Although it never, I think, quite looked as grand as this. Some of you may recall it, in this particular room, in its original form, it was originally the Reds Hall. It's obviously a grand place to uh, intimidate the people when they came to pay their rates. Some of you uh, may remember it, but might not admit to it, uh, as Willie Thorne's Snooker Hall, uh, the place of many misspent youths. I'm sure not those of anybody here. But uh, what we have this evening is the first of what's intended to be a series of lectures and presentations, and it's my job to, uh, to warm you up. I hope to come to the, to the rest of the, of the series uh, and to talk a little bit about my understanding, and I have to stress it is my understanding, of, of Leicester's planning story, its past and its future. And in doing that, I'm, I'm intensely aware there's lots of people in the audience here this evening who know probably far more about both its past and its planning than I do. But uh, I hope uh, they'll perhaps uh, save me the embarrassment of actually interrupting while I'm talking and perhaps just keep it for the questions at the end. Um, but I, I do speak as an amateur, in, every, in the sense of that word. I, I'm not a professional planner, I'm not a professional historian. But I do speak, I hope, well, this will be evident from the presentation I'm going to make, as somebody who loves the city in that sense, an amateur. Uh, and it's a great city to love. Uh, and it's a city that is increasingly, I think, willing to celebrate what it has to, uh, to tell the world about and to be proud of. And I think it is today much more proud and much more self-confident than perhaps was the case not so long ago. And that's perhaps for another day. The reasons that that's what I've described on other occasions as a collective inferiority complex. But I think we haven't got over it. Now, of course, we've had some reminders of what we've got to be proud of. Uh, some bones found in the car park. But of course, Richard III, as important as he was in English history, was a little more than a footnote, but barely a chapter in Leicester's proud 2,000 years of history. And of course, we've also hit the national and the international papers and television with uh, the success on a field that used to be our power station, the King Power Stadium, where of course uh, we managed to do a Leicester, as it is now known, and uh, win the Premier League. But Leicester is, in many respects, a typical city. It's not unusual in its size in, in the UK. It's a particularly attractive city. But, uh, what, 300 and odd thousand within the administrative boundaries? A city of some 600,000, if you count the, the urban area that really is Leicester. Um, but it is unusual, I think, in having those 2,000 years of continuous history. Not sure which can lay claim to that. And there's evidence of that in the streets around us and in the shape of the, of the city in the 21st century. It's also, I think, unusual in the way in which it is situated in the heart of its county, with a satellite band of market towns around the city, and a very, very attractive setting that uh, is Leicestershire and indeed Rutland and beyond that. And I think it's also uh, particularly unusual in the extensive archaeology that's been done in Leicester. And I don't know whether Richard Buckley and his colleagues are here this evening, but they and their predecessors have done a remarkable job in literally uncovering the past of Leicester and interpreting with enormous skill not just the bones of the king, but so much else about the life of the ordinary people in Leicester over those 2,000, those 2000 years. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit initially about those 2,000 years, but uh, I'm aware that. Um, as I said, I, I don't speak with any particular expertise, and I do want, right at the start, to recommend to you three really good sources when looking at the history of Leicester. One is the recently published Quality of Leicester, 
wonderful work that uh, Michael Taylor has done for us. And if you haven't got your copy yet, it's, uh, it's available at all good bookstores. Uh, and also, of course, at the Liz Lester store. And also, one that's perhaps got less attention, but equally deserves to be recommended to you, which is Lester, A Modern History. Um, published uh, by uh, Rogers and Majin as the, as the editors, but a number of contributors to it, which does describe with a lot more authority than I can the period from the <coughs> beginning of the 20th century through to, through to the present. Uh, and the final thing I want to recommend to you as a source that is at least as good a read today as it was when I first visited it, and that's the works of Jack Simmons, Professor Jack Simmons of the University, uh, who is uh, sadly died at uh, I think the year 2000, um, but uh, is as readable today and is as good a source. Uh, of, the, uh, of an understanding of where Lester came from, where modern Lester came from, as any. But I'm going to try and split what I, what I talk about into, into four parts. Firstly, I am going to talk, regardless of my lack of expertise in the subject, about the, the, the 2,000 years that brought us up to the 20th century. Uh, I'm going to talk about the latter part of the 20th century, which is something that perhaps I do know something of from, from first-hand experience. I'm going to talk fairly, fairly briefly about some of the things that we're doing now in planning for the future of Leicester because I've talked on many other platforms about that and there will be many other opportunities to talk about it. But I want to conclude by talking about some of the challenges for the future in the planning of Leicester and the urban, and the urban settlement. Now, uh, it was, as I say, a pre-Roman settlement. Some wonderful illustrations uh, done uh, recently, I think, uh, in association with the with, uh, with Leicester University, seeking to reconstruct what, it, what Roman Leicester was like. But obviously what the Romans found when they came here was uh, a tribal capital that predated them. A tribal capital was here for, for good reason. It was by the river, it was a good fording point, later of course the Romans bridged it. Um, it had a bit of high ground that was defensible, where later the Romans and, and the Normans built fortifications. Um, and it was, for the Romans, uh, very well located indeed. Um, somewhere where they could plan a town. Plan a town on their boss road, their boss way, which took the Roman traveller from Exeter in the southwest towards Lincoln as it turned from Leicester but passing to Wilchester, Bath, Simoncester on the way, it was a major settlement yeah. on a major road. And of course, Roman towns were planned towns. And they had within them what we would now know as the major crossroads that is the High Street and High Cross Street, right at its heart. It had the North Gate, that we still know as North Gates. It had the South Gates, that we still know as the South Gates. It had, of course, the West Bridge. It was still the West Bridge. And it had these gates, just near the clock tower. And all of it had within it a grid. And a grid that's perhaps wobbled a bit in the intervening centuries, but it's still very evident today. And as part of their planning as a town, they, of course, had to provide the infrastructure. They had to provide, we can still see it at the Lord Ikes, the, the aqueduct there that would bring water in. They had a forum, a space for a market, a space for a barbican, a space for the theatre, a space for temples, and of course they had their baths beside the river. And we have today what is reputedly the, the largest non-military piece of Roman history in the UK, the remains of, of those baths. Something that deserves to be, and some of you have heard the recent announcement about it, something that deserves to be celebrated more in Leicester, interpreted better, and used more to explain to people those 400 years of Leicester's history that were the, were the Roman period. It's made better for us now, in terms of what we can do with it, by the fact that we have now acquired Law College next to it, and that does enable us, with the friends of, of Jury Wall, to talk about some very exciting ways of interpreting that, that Roman period and life in a Roman town, a major Roman town, as, as Leicester was. Now, of course, there were periods that followed that, and as I've said, most of them left very tangible evidence behind. Perhaps the one that didn't was the Viking period, 
perhaps we don't have as much as, as many other places. But nonetheless, those of you who were at a lecture that Michael Wood gave at Slust University will be aware that there are other records from which one can infer a considerable amount of what importance uh, the Vikings attached to what was one of the burials within the Danelaw that uh, was Leicester. While they may not have left very much by way of uh, of, of physical evidence, the Saxons certainly did. <coughs> they left us the wonderful St. Nicholas Church. Um, of course, um, peppered with uh, Roman masonry, because even in those days, the best of people knew how to do recycling. <laughs> and what they produced, of course, was an absolute gem. That's as old as place of worship, uh, and something that I think we're rightly proud of, and uh, deserves, along with the celebration of the Jury Wall, to be uh, more understood uh, and, um, and better interpreted and visited. Now, then along came the Normans. And within two years of the conquest, uh, William had, uh, had ordered the construction of fortifications here in Leicester. So it obviously mattered. It was uh, in the Doomsday Book recorded as having 322 uh, houses and six churches. And if you think of that as a ratio, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty good in terms of our, uh, our ancestors' uh, devotion to the church and the place of the church in their lives. Um, but what the Normans did, and you see that, that illustration of it there, was again to look at ways of ensuring that the important river crossing, the fording point, the bridging point, of course, by there, uh, was, uh, was, well, was well defended. And I'm going to skip through quite a lot of the intervening centuries because otherwise I could talk for a long time and destroy for you the, the pleasure, which I hope you will take, of buying the Quality of Leicester book and, and reading about it from a more authoritative source. Actually, during those intervening centuries, a lot happened in Leicester, but it was still, by modern standards, quite small. That's the built area in 1820, set within the modern boundaries of the, of the city of Leicester. Still clustered around the river crossing, still clustered around the heart of the, of the city as, as, as we now view it, uh, and still uh, something that uh, had a comparatively, by modern standards, low population. It had seen a lot of growth in the intervening periods, the 12th, 13th centuries, saw priories, uh, they saw the abbey, where Wolsey would, in later centuries, visit and die, on his way back in disgrace, called back by Henry VIII, uh, and it saw churches enlarged and rebuilt. But if you look at the 1620 map, which that is, you see still the grid that was essentially the Romans. So it's wobbled a bit over the, over the centuries, some bits of it. It is essentially contained within what the Romans would have known of as the, as the town, and it is within that in a pattern that uh, is significantly uh, one that was inherited from many centuries earlier from the, from the Romans. It grew beyond there, but it did leave us some very fine buildings. The Guild Hall, for many centuries, the seat of, of local government in, uh, in Leicester. In many of the old postcards and illustrations, described as the old town hall. Uh, moved out from there in the, um, uh, in the um, 1870 period uh, into the new town hall in Town Hall Square. But in the period running up to that, uh, the city did see some very fine buildings built and planned and built in Leicester. We saw, for example, the area immediately adjacent to that, the area that is Prior Lane, Millstone Lane, uh, with some, some fine buildings from, from that period, and then other buildings in other parts as, as it developed on, that uh, in the names of the streets tell us their period. King Street, Duke Street, Regent Road. Yes, we know when they were when they were laid out. Wellington <coughs> Street. Yes, I think we've got a good idea of what prompted that, that particular road name. And we also saw, and this is something I'm coming to later, um, some really quite outstanding buildings in that area. The Crescent. 
Now, I've been around in Leicester long enough to remember when the Crescent was semi-derelict and boarded up. And due to make way for a road scheme, and I'll say a bit about road schemes in a, in a few minutes, uh, it was saved, and um, I was talking actually to uh, some of the people who were actually involved in saving it uh, a couple of months ago, and so they're rightly very proud of, uh, of what they did. What we also saw was something that was quite unique in the planning of Leicester, which was New Walk. The pedestrianised way from the heart of the city, from the hotel, the hotel street, uh, out to the racecourse, and what is now now Victoria Park. And of course, in looking at it, we still see not just the advantages of having laid it out, but the advantages of putting planning restrictions on it, which it did at an early stage. What, who could build and what they could build there was, was prescribed from an early stage. Um, and of course, we have, in recent times, had an opportunity to <coughs> rediscover, in a sense, some of the things that we've been neglecting over recent years from some of those earlier centuries. Wilkes' house, uh, when I was elected as mayor, had a padlock on it. And that had been, that had been visited for a long time. We revealed it rather more. But it is worth saying, because I'm going to mention him later, that Conrad Smigelski, who of course is sometimes demonised, was, I'm reliably informed, very largely responsible for making sure the road didn't go through that, through that building. Uh, and there is a debate about whether he was uh, an entirely bad thing for Leicester. Anyway, I'll come to that in a minute. Let me take you on. Leicester grew uh, and continued to grow during the uh, 19th century, most particularly. If you look at that map, the built area in 1820, being the brown bit I showed earlier, by 1914, and a lot of it had actually grown by, by 1900, the city had grown from a population of 17,000 to a population of 211,000. Astonishing growth of that, now by, by, by any standard. And what that saw was, of course, some development, it was far from desirable. You permissively describe us as cottages or courts. Uh, of course, in the 20th century, defined, I think, quite accurately as slums. Some rather better than others, but nonetheless, uh, none of a standard that really you would want to bring a family in. It's all a lot better than that, though, as well. Because the reformed corporation that was elected in the, I say elected, I can go into to what extent there really was much of a, a, a wide franchise at the time, but the reformed corporation that was uh, established in the 1830s was uh, very reforming. Uh, they were very radical as well. They, they sold the silver, the municipal silver that was associated with the previous regime, uh, corrupt as they saw it, and appointed one of the very first inspectors of nuisances. Now I have to tell you, it, I suppose I have thought of uh, reinstating. <laughs> I can think of quite a lot of things in the 21st century that uh, we could set an inspector of nuisances onto doing. But to be serious, uh, it was a reflection of their, their commitment to do things about the sanitary conditions in the, in, the, in the town and the public health in the town. And Leicester, on the back of the, the work of George Brown, who was the, the first inspector of nuisances, in 1846, it was one of the first municipalities to appoint a medical officer. And it's one of the reasons I'm so delighted to see public health coming back to local government as it has done over the last few years, because it's back where it belongs, uh, and where, where we both started uh, in, the, uh, in the early decades of the, uh, of the 19th century. But of course, the latter part of the century, with the work of those reformers, and the bylaws that they enacted, <coughs> produced a considerably improved standard of housing. Housing that today is as appropriate and as popular as it was when it was first built. Uh, you take the cars out, that hasn't changed much in the, well, much more than a century since, 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 since it was built. Um, and it's still decent quality because those bylaws that they enacted ensured that it was. Um, and I'll say a bit more about 
the difference between that and the slums, in a few minutes I'll talk about some of my own experience in, in the early part of the, uh, of, of the, uh, well, the last part of the 20th century. But, of course, it wasn't just the housing, or indeed the public health was concerned about. They were also concerned about the more general well-being of the, the community, and they established some stunning parks. That was valuable development land. And it's Abbey Park. Uh, isn't it tremendous? <coughs> After Joe, a real tribute to the, the people who had the foresight to set that aside. But it wasn't just Abbey Park, that was where they began. <coughs> then there was the East Park, East Park Road, Spinney Hill Park, as we know it today, and the Western Park, that's that vast sway on, on the western side of the city, and so many others in, in between. But it was all valuable development land, and some of it was the developers themselves setting it aside. And I do want to talk about one particular development who the developer who particularly left his mark uh, on, the, uh, on, on the city from the 19th century. And I want to talk about one Arthur Wakeley. Wakeley Road, Noel, Gwendolyn, Ethel, Constance. They were all the family. Uh, and of course, uh, what he did was to, to produce, for the time, a, a model, a sustainable urban extension. Uh, we'll talk about sustainable urban extensions briefly at, at, the end of my, at the end of my talk, but that's what he was setting out to do. It was to have, and did have, um, its own temperance hotel. It had quality housing. It had a fire station. The marketplace and the market hall, they're all there today. Uh, and of course, it had the very fine Wesley Hall that was the Methodist Hall, uh, right up on the, on the high, high point of the hill there. Um, he was uh, an architect, a town planner, um, a councillor, a mayor, a chairman of the housing committee. Indeed, you'll see on the boards outside there some of his innovative designs for, for his 200 pound houses that some of which the council built, and many of which you can still see across the city. They uh, had high ideals, and I think we have a lot to thank them for in the, in the 21st century. Um, of course, there's lots of other things happened during the 19th century that helped fuel the growth of the city, literally. The first goes back to the river, which is where I started, and it was its canalisation. <laughs> 1790s, the navigation got through to Leicester, and it brought goods in, it brought coal, it took goods out, and it improved trade. But the thing that really made the difference to modern Leicester and to the way it grew in the 19th century would undoubtedly have been the railway. <clears throat> we in Leicester, and of course everybody's heard of the Stockton to Darlington Railway, but we in Leicester, of course, had an even better railway than very soon afterwards, which was the Swanton line, which came down to Westbridge and brought coal <coughs> down from the gold fields into Leicester. Seeing the price of coal plummet in Leicester and seeing industry thrive. Um, and quite hot on its heels came what we now know as the middle of the main line, and our link to the cities of the north and down to, 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 to the capital. At one time, of course, uh, we had another railway. The Great Central. Um, and I've heard it suggested that when they closed the main line, they may not necessarily close the right one. But we had, as a result of the coming of the middle main line, as we now know it, a change in the focus of the city. And it's interesting, if I can digress for a moment, to reflect on the discussion that has been recently about the effect of the High Cross. That talk about, you know, what does that mean to Market Street and Phoenix? Well, if you think historically, the High Cross was the heart of the town. And it was the railway that brought the development down Granby Street, what our Gallagher Gate, outside of the walls of the town, down Gallagher Gate, down Granby Street, and towards the uh, original station, now obviously replaced by the, uh, the very fine one that fronts onto London Road. And if you look back over the, uh, over the centuries, the retailing heart of 
the city has moved, and has moved with the times. And it is hardly surprising that it will continue to move, and will move again, no doubt, in, 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 in decades and centuries to come. And while, of course, you know, people can regret the loss of a particular part of the city and a particular shop, uh, I think we do need to try to see, when we talk about that, the historic context, and I'll talk right at the end about the, the future of the city centre and indeed retail within it. But I'm going to need to move fairly quickly through the early part of the 20th century. Those fine parks are still being there, of course. But the early part of the 20th century saw, of course, uh, suburbanisation. It saw the need for Leicester, as elsewhere, to seek to provide homes with the heroes. And the very fine estates, uh, two obvious ones that I, I would pick out, uh, the Saffron Lane estate in North Bronston, which were built very high ideals and very much influenced by what was perceived to be the best in providing a decent home away from Wolf Street, a decent home for those who were, uh, who were cleared from the slums uh, and needed affordable, publicly provided rented housing. And of course it wasn't just the council that was, was developing. We saw then, and I'm not sure I've got a picture of it here, but there's certainly a picture of it on the boards out there, uh, the development of Western Park. Letchworth Road, I mean, that says it all, doesn't it? I mean, you know, they didn't just choose that name out of a hat. It was because, of course, we were very much influenced by the Garden City movement. And that is, is very evident, not just in the road names, but also in, in what was produced in that, in that wonderful area of private housing. Uh, but Leicester uh, grew, and I hope, yes, it grew from 1820s, and its boundaries grew with it. In fact, for the most part, its boundaries grew ahead of it. And boundaries there extended in 1835, you see the purple line, around the city, that was still significantly close to the size that it had been in, what, well, many centuries prior to that. And it continued to grow. Um, yeah, it's, it's flipped through that rather quickly, but you'll see the yellow is the built area in 1914. And you'll see that that was entirely contained within the boundaries that the city has extended in 1891. It's a point I'm going to come to right, right at the end, but I want to sort of make it now as, as we go. Um, and of course the city itself was, was aware that it was expanding, and I love the strap line down the bottom, it's, it's something that uh, you know, has been true across the centuries. Leicester needs a plan. Uh, and of course he did then as much as he does now. That um, is an awareness uh, in, I think, the immediate post-war period of how it developed up until the outbreak of the war, and you'll see the present city boundary almost entirely uh, encompasses and leaves space within it for the development that was, uh, was planned to come. Uh, I am often criticised for pedestrianisation. Um, I think... Uh, I'm often also criticised for us not having a tram system. Um, I think that's uh, pre pedestrianisation and with the tram, and it didn't look a particularly comfortable place to get about. And neither did the clock tower look a particularly good place to try and drive through. And of course, that challenge led the council in the 1930s to build the first bypass being, of course, Charles Street. Media outside of our door, the clock tower behind us, and this building. But it wasn't their intention that it would be the last one. And that, uh, I've, I've not yet to put a date on it, it must be in the immediate post-war period, and maybe others here know better than I, was the, was the big picture of what the roads of Leicester would be look like. And you will see across the city fragments of that, and in some cases, it's, built in, 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 in significant uh, in significant parts, was in fragments of that, particularly in the dual carriageways that were developed in some of the suburban areas. Because at that time, the development of a dual carriageway was thought to be the way in, of increasing the speed and the capacity of the roads. I think 
certainly uh, in the cities we know in the 21st century, it isn't so much the width of the roads that makes a difference to their capacity, but the capacity of the junctions to which those cars come. Because it's very quick, very easy to speed on a dual carriageway between junctions and find you're sitting for a long time at that junction waiting to get through. It's the junction that makes a difference. But that's, that, that was what they, what they had in mind. And of course, in the post-war period, some very grand plans. And the man I mentioned earlier, Conrad Smigelsi. Uh, that was how he described himself, as somebody who had resisted the temptation to tear the heart, uh, sorry, to tear out the city's heart, and to build a comprehensive plan as a monument to himself. Now, others here are better equipped than I to judge whether that was, uh, I wasn't a politician, but it's just the sort of thing I hear from the mouths of politicians, not quite so often from planners. Uh, but it was very interesting that he, he did have a vision for the city, and of course, some of that vision was, uh, well, ahead of its time, because that is just out there. Uh, and my office is just, oh, I, I couldn't have my own stop, actually. It's just the top, uh, top right hand corner there. Uh, but yes, he had grand plans. Um, now, we were we talking earlier about this one. It, it, this is in Humberson Gate, yes, linking the monorail station and bus stop in Charles Street. Yeah, so that's, you know, it was, uh, it was a grand plan. Um, and of course, that was what it was supposed to look like around the clock tower. Um, what we got was uh, something that actually was pretty insensitive in terms of sweeping away the fine area around the Haymarket uh, and producing what uh, is not the best of uh, 1970s architecture. And something that I think we learned from later when we came to do other schemes in the city centre. Um, but I did want to stop on this one because some of you have heard me use this one before. Uh, Nicholas Pepsner. Uh, was looking at, of course, uh, Leicester, along with most of the rest of the UK, in 1960 in our case. And he said, the group of the Castle, St Mary's, the Newark, St Nicholas, the Roman Baths, St Martin's, and the Guildhall is something the patriotic citizens of Leicester might proudly take any visitor to, I love this last bit, British or foreign. <laughs> Even the foreigners would appreciate it. Um, and of course, in a sense, that was what Pepsner was reflecting, although that's obviously a picture from an earlier, from an earlier period. But that's the area uh, that, he was, that he was talking about there. And of course, what we got, within 10 years of Pepsner writing that, was that. <coughs> the underpass, uh, carving through the edge of the Roman Forum, uh, spinning, spinning the thunder, uh, and of course, uh, throwing on one side the castle, jury wall, St. Nicholas, and on the other side, the guild hall, St. Martin's Church, Wiggerson's house, um, and it's split it asunder. And I'll talk briefly in a bit about, about reconnecting across that, but it is a challenge for us in the 21st century. But I wanted to show you that. Um, in the early 1970s, Slum clearance was the accepted doctrine of the City Council. In the early 1970s, that is but one page of one month's minutes of the City Council, and each line is a property purchase for clearance. I think that month, these are the non compulsory purchase ones, so there's another list of compulsory purchases. In that month alone, uh, I think there were four of those, you know, sort of eight, 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 eight pages in total of, 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 of properties to be purchased by the council for clearance. And, of course, with that clearance, Leicester did get <coughs> some of what many other cities got, which was tower blocks and deck access flats, and some of the problems that go with it. We got St. Peter's, St. Matthew's, uh, later, St. Mark's, uh, St. Andrew's. I, I often wondered why they were all saints. <laughs> now, whether they thought there was some sort of biblical instruction to, uh, to, uh, to, to actually undertake this, uh, this, this mission of uh, 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 clearing the slums. And to some extent, of course, they did clear the slums. 
But the bulldozers kept rolling. And they were not just rolling through the slums and replacing them with bones in the sky. They were increasingly moving into the sort of housing I was showing you earlier that had been built under the bylaws to very high, much higher standards. And that was under threat. And it, across the whole rest of it was under threat. And it was um, being cleared not just for the housing, but also for the roads. And I'll say a bit, a bit about that in a minute. But what happened in 1973 in Leicester happened sooner than, as far as I know, anywhere else, and more comprehensively than anywhere else. Because prior to the period of 74, actually, 74, 75, um, the mantra had been clear the slums, build the new houses, 1,000 houses a year the council was proudly building, and it really was, 1,000 homes a year. Uh, some of them like that, going on to Beaumont Lees with very different aspirations, but they were building 1,000 homes a year to replace the ones that they were demolishing and to make way for the roads. But what happened in Leicester was that we had first a general improvement area, Clarendon Park. And Clarendon Park was picked as a general improvement area, a silent form at time, but it was picked as a general improvement area because it was the best of what remained. And it was picked on the basis of being the best first. We'll come to the other, others with the slum clearance, we'll preserve the best because we're not going to get there for a few decades yet. The slum clearance isn't going to go through Clarendon Park yet. And it was the best first. What we were able to do, because in the 1970s so many of the political establishment decamped to County Hall with the establishment of Leicester, Leicester loss of its position as a, as a county borough and the establishment of the county, new county council, what we were left with then was the opportunity for those who were new in the council to halt the bulldozers in Leicester earlier than any comparable city. And to establish a renewal strategy that saw the transformation of that housing throughout the city in a way that was more comprehensive than any comparable city. Very much helped, we were, by some visionary officers, John Dean, the city planning officer at the time, and I hope John may be here this evening, uh, but aided also by Gordon Smith, the city of state surveyor, Derek Jean, the city engineer, and, and others, uh, who were up for it. Uh, and a plan to stop those bulldozers that was uh, hatched up in the back bedroom and bounced through a labour group uh, unexpectedly um, and changed the face of what is now Leicester because it stopped at uh, uh, that, uh, that random and wholesale demolition. What it sought to do was to look for the worst to look where there were bathrooms and where there weren't. And there were many of those houses didn't have indoor bathrooms, didn't have bathrooms at all, didn't have inside toilets, didn't have a decent roof, needed central heating because they hadn't got any. And with a comprehensive scheme of individual improvement grants, owners making contributions, with envelope scheme, with front wall schemes, with back wall schemes, with alleyways gated, with roads closed, with curb crawling banished, with pocket parks created. What was possible then was to save what is now, I think, something that is not just a decent home for the individual, but real communities for people to enjoy in the 21st century. Um, something that perhaps, you know, on another occasion we talk rather more about. But it did mean that virtually the whole of the terraced housing in Leicester was given life. And the communities that were there were given the opportunity to remain there rather than to go into the soulless blocks that so many other cities saw so much of and we saw too much of. I'm pleased to see in the audience some mentioned in you particularly who were around at that time and Ned I think can speak with more authority than I can both about what happened then and about the slums that, that were being swept away and I 
I was recommending books earlier on. I do recommend Ned's book on the slums of Leicester, amongst uh, its many other publications on the 19th, 20th century history of Leicester, as, uh, as further reading for those of you who are interested. Um, but one of the points I wanted to make uh, very importantly about what led to that change and the stopping of the bulldozers was that it coincided with and was very much influenced by the change in Leicester's communities. Because the communities who had chosen to make their homes in Leicester in the early 1970s were choosing owner occupation. Some because there was no alternative, no chance of renting. Um, some because obviously it was something that they wanted to buy into, they, they wanted you know, to, to, to make a commitment to. But particularly the South Asian communities that were making less of their home in the early 1970s, many of course have been there before, but you know, we talk obviously particularly about those who came from East Africa in that period, but particularly they were very vociferous in wanting to stop the bulldozers. And I can remember many fraught public meetings when we had to try to persuade some communities that actually there were amongst the majority of ours that could be saved, a few that just had so, such severe structural faults that there would be no alternative but to bring them down. It was difficult. Um, but it was achieved by some very committed officers um, and by a <coughs> tremendous amount of engagement with the community and particularly <coughs> by the commitment of those comparatively new communities who uh, had made us their home. Now I'm going to have to move on. Uh, and probably look fairly quickly through the, the, the rest of my slides. But I've said it wasn't just the bulldozer for the uh, slum clearance, it was the bulldozers for the roads. That's, uh, I think, 1975. Um, and that is a particular scheme I want to mention. Uh, it wasn't the only one. There was the Westbridge scheme as well. I can talk at some length about that one and how we stopped a part of it and probably stopped the wrong part of it. Uh, but that one, uh, just to orientate you, has uh, down at the bottom, as you look at it, uh, the London Road. And that there is Mayfield Road roundabout. And where the road goes from there is through St. James's Road, right through the middle of it. Can you believe it? Through Upper Titchbourne Street. You know, those fine terraces, those wonderful. Houses there, all the way down to Highfields, through Cross Conduit Street, Cross the Railway, down to uh, Hobbison Road. Um, compulsory purchase, rehousing, compensation, know your rights. It was, it was going to happen. Um, it was stopped, and I'm very proud of the fact it was stopped. It was stopped as part of the same momentum that had started to value the communities of the inner city of Leicester and had started to value the houses that we'd inherited from those who'd set high standards under the, under the bylaws uh, of, the, uh, 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 of the earlier period. Right, I'm going to be very brief with this because I've talked about it on previous occasions. We've got a challenge today. Uh, and the uh, challenge is that we have inherited a city that uh, did a lot to make way for the motor car uh, and needs now to redress the balance. Not anti car despite what many might say about it. Uh, in the 21st century, it's an essential part of making a, making a town or a city work. But the balance was wrong. Um, and the reconnection of the uh, oases of excellence, that I originally described them, in the, in the city centre has been part of what connecting us, well, it's been the essential part of what connecting us has been about. Bringing down York Centre helped. Uh, that's where Matty Early Woods are moving back in, significantly, from the periphery, back into the city centre, wanting to be part of a real city, wanting to have their offices here, and to work here and bring their customers into part of a real city. Um, and of course, improving the public realm, not just by ourselves, as a council, but with partners. In that case, of course, with our partners in the cathedral, transforming it from the before to what the world saw when we were burying King Richard. Uh, dramatic transformation. Um, I still do get people who say they want their car park back. 
Uh, not many. No. But I do, do still get it. Um, or they think that it's too far to walk 50 yards across to get the bus, and they'd rather have that bus lay by. Um, but uh, I think I prefer it like that. Mm. Uh, and uh, of course, it's not finished. I could talk quite a bit about what we're doing in, in, in this part of the city, uh, but I'll just let the pictures do the talking. Uh, and what it's doing, of course, is what we must continue to do, is to recognise that the city is only vibrant if people want to be here, if people want to live here, if people want to work here, and if people want to invest here. Delilah's, um, excellent yeah. delicatessen. Milton State Bar now, uh, the Italian wine place immediately opposite, and many more to come. Um, I think in the next couple of days we've got some exciting announcements about St. Martin Square, uh, immediately adjacent to it. Um, which of course, if I can just digress for a moment, uh, is worth saying something about, because of course there was a time when Centre 21 <coughs> Proposals for the motorway junction made it impossible to get anybody to invest in the city centre. And St. Martin Square was the first breakthrough on backhand that the council purchased as part of that spree of compulsory purchase. We'd, we'd purchased all those uh, houses on uh, Lowesby Lane and so on to build a multi story car park, by the way. <coughs> Honestly, uh, that's, that's how we came to own it. That's how we came to the backhand where St. Martin's going to be built. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to have to move on. More to be done. Uh, you've seen these before. Creating quality public space in the city, um, something that the Romans would have recognised uh, in terms of you know, the need for there to be public space, for people to meet, to relax, people to eat whatever the Roman equivalent was of a sandwich. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, places uh, to. Uh, and also, uh, as I said, um, in part of the redress and the balance, to recognise that it isn't just the cars, it's also the, the pedestrians and cyclists, and incidentally, uh, something that's increasingly we're getting support from government. Uh, we had an announcement this morning uh, from the government of a very significant investment in our cycling, it came to Leicester to make the announcement on the back of, uh, of our government. And again, just to stress, it's not just what the council's doing, it's also what partners are doing. We could close Millstone Lane, but it took the Moffat University's vision and investment to create that space, um, which is possible because of something that I haven't had time to talk about today, which is of course the City Challenge Project, uh, which transformed the very scrapyards, where we took asbestos out of railway carriages just over the way from that. It transformed that uh, scrapyard into Bee Park, at the same time as of course it um, regenerated the former power station site for a different sort of power, and that's of course King Power, mm -hmm. because of course that's, that's where King Power is today. And of course, a scheme I'm particularly proud of, which is one that really does talk about the past of Leicester and its future, because Friars Mills had its roof burnt off and it was lost. Uh, I was in there yesterday with the uh, board of the Canal River Trust. Uh, very proud. Uh, <coughs> Chamber of Commerce, who are acting as our agents there, already got it 80% left. Uh, Waterside, um, signing up with the developers hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've already got 85% uh, of, the, of the site around there. Offices uh, as part of it, there with uh, 300 odd houses behind it. Um, Leicester University doing its bit, National Science uh, Space Park, uh, and I want to put that one in because it comes back to the theme of parks. Um, when they did Victoria Park, sorry, when they did Abbey Park, uh, the Victorians turned their back on the city um, because, of course, the gasworks were just over the, over the other side of the very dirty canal. Uh, and Wall Street and slums were over, over there. They built a mound. They called it the gas bank. Uh, well, getting across and relinking back to the city centre is an opportunity to work the 21st century because of course the slums of Wall Street are gone, the cast works are gone, um, and the canal is now seen as a major asset by us and indeed by the Canal River Trust. Uh, I'll come back again to what I mentioned earlier on. Um, exciting plans for the reinterpretation of our past, in that case obviously the Roman past, but in this case our railway past. This is the Great Central Railway, and 
National Rail Museum, with the Great Central Railway and ourselves as partners, are signed up to a major centre there that will show off that, that wonderful national collection within our boundaries, just. And I'm going to conclude on the boundaries. Um, Yeah. Those, they, they, they speak for themselves. I'm going to conclude on the boundaries because I'm going to talk about the challenges of the future. Continuing to make the city centre vital and vibrant and exciting and a place where people want to live, to work and to invest is a vital part of the challenge of the future. And I make no apology for investing in it. It's our future, it's our shop window, if it was the only place we're investing, if we weren't building schools, then yes, I, I would accept the criticism, but we're building schools. We're building for communities across the city, but we must keep investing in that city centre. And of course, uh, we must recognise that as well as attracting investment, we've got to get the infrastructure to get in and out of the city. And that those grand ideas for roads, uh, We've got to have our own ideas of, of what's needed for the future by way of infrastructure. Everybody won't come in on a bike, everybody won't walk in, and not everybody will come in on the bus. <coughs> we do need to have roads, and we do need some roads. <coughs> Within the city, we are still challenged by river crossings, same as the roads were. We've got West Bridge as they did. But think about it. Going north, not a lot. Of course you can get across Labby Park, Overland <coughs> Road. Of course now we've got some other links further out. There's Watermead Way, developed in the 1980s. Going south, we've got major challenges on Upperton Road, major challenges on Middleton Street, and Elson Village, and then of course the road built in the last couple of decades, which is Salt Valley Way. We've got challenges with the links there, and we've also got challenges within the city uh, on its ring road. You only have to look at what happens to Vaughan Way when people want to come in and go shopping to know that that's not sustainable. And we've got to think of ways of, well, we've got, we've got some ideas of ways, I might answer some questions about ways of actually addressing that. Um, but I wanted to conclude with that map and a quick run through the maps I'm sure you were. You'll see how intensely developed Leicester is within its boundary. And you will see on that map the areas of development. And almost every single one of them is beyond the city's administrative boundary. So too, much of the space that is so vital to us, which is the green space, the green wedges of the, of the city, as you see, <coughs> it's very long there. And if I can come back to the maps I showed earlier, really, on my final few slides before I take the questions. That's our administrative area today. Built area in the 1820s. Boundaries moving outwards. 1835 boundary around the 1820 built area. Certainly haven't built it. 1891 boundary. <coughs> and the built area that came to fill in that. 1914. It's not quite contemporaneous, but you can get the point that the city was well within its boundaries and has plenty of opportunity beyond the built area to do some of the things that the city needs, needs to do in terms of planning for growth. The built area in 1939, still largely within the boundary that had been established in uh, 1890s, uh, but not entirely, because there was then a further boundary extension, which is pretty much what it is today. <coughs> Little tweet on the edges, but you'll see the city was largely within it. I hope you will see that's the city today. And of course, the city today 
isn't within its boundaries. And that, I think, is a major issue. It is a, an accident, in a sense. It's an accident of what happened in 1973. In many other places where they became metropolitan districts, boundaries were extended. In Leicester, in Nottingham, there's another example of observed boundaries. The Trent Bridge isn't in Nottingham. <coughs> um, you know, another example of observed boundaries, and then Bristol, you know, the three largest non-met districts. We have grown through our boundaries. Isn't it crazy when you talk about Foss Park, you're talking about something that is in Blaby, 200 yards outside the city's boundary. If you talk about the motorway junction and the importance of the infrastructure that, that represents and what needs to be done to improve that junction and to provide other junctions uh, to, uh, to complement it, uh, they're just tantalizingly beyond the administrative boundary of the city. And of course, when you look at new housing development, which is coming, and that's what I showed on the, that, that, that earlier map, what uh, Wakeley was able to do as a sustainable urban development within the boundary, an extension within the boundary, is not possible for us today. The sustainable urban extensions and the developments are beyond the boundary of the city. Now, there will be some here who I know uh, will be from beyond the boundary. Some live beyond the boundary, some work beyond the boundary. And it is certainly the case that there is a much greater uh, sense of interdependence between the city and its county today than was ever the case in my experience throughout the latter part of the 20th century, the early part of the 21st century. And there is a recognition that we all have to think together about the urban area that is Leicester and indeed the wider Leicester area and that we can't solve it within the boundary and it is their problem as well as ours. But it is not the same as having the responsibility of a single place. <coughs> a series of district councils, two-tier authority over there, a series of district councils, county council, a lot of different interests uh, and very difficult for anybody to actually see the big picture, literally. So I'm going to conclude there, and just simply say that uh, I hope I haven't done too much injustice to the history of the city. There are those here who will no doubt correct me if I have. I haven't, I hope, uh, too badly misrepresented the planning and the development of the city, but it is certainly my view that Leicester is a city that is rightly proud of its past. Um, I think today, appropriately confident about its future. And I do believe that the series that Grant in a moment is going to talk about that follows on from here will enable us to explore the past, the present, and the future of the city in more detail than I've been able to this evening. Uh, and I think looking back uh, throughout the Roman period and in the centuries since then, Leicester has changed, changed again, and has grown. Um, and as it has changed and as it has grown, the responsibility of those in governance has been <coughs> to, as far as they can, predict the change, as far as is necessary to provide for the change, but always to be aware of it and to see to reflect it in their decision making about the future. Um, to summarise, uh, frankly, planning a great city is always work in progress. Thank you very much.